Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. Uh, today I'm happy to have uh, joining us uh, my friend and colleague, Kelly Dean Jolly. He's professor of philosophy and Goodwin Philpott Endowed Chair in Religion here at Auburn University. Uh, he has a PhD from University of Rochester, like Eric Mack, who I interviewed in episode eight. In fact, they both studied with Lewis White Beck, although in, in different geological eras. Um, Kelly's the author of three strikingly different books, The Concept Horse Paradox and Wittgensteinian Conceptual Investigations, published formerly by Ashgate, but now by Routledge, a book of poetry, Stony Lonesome from New Plains Press, and Chuck, Real Love and the Spy Life, a book about the spy fi television show Chuck, which is available as a free download on his website, uh, kellydeanjolly.com, and I'll have a link to that in the description. In fact, I'll have a link to all the stuff in the description. He's also the editor of the anthology, Wittgenstein Key Concepts, published formerly by Acumen and now once again by the All Devouring Routledge. In the interest of full disclosure, I also have a couple of pieces in that anthology, one standalone and one uh, uh, co-authored with Kelly. Uh, he also has a, uh, a blog and a podcast accessible from his uh, website. The podcast is called The Sound of Thinking. Uh, the blog is called Quantum est in rebus inane, which means how much in quantum physics is inane, and is Kelly's way of picking a fight with our mutual colleague, Eli Shack. Right, right. You, can, you can believe that or not believe it, as uh, my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Biarzi, used to say. Kelly has a broad range of research interests across uh, historical and contemporary, across analytic and continental, uh, interests ranging from Jane Austen to J.L. Austen, from Greek philosophy to Greek Orthodox theology, from film theory to the foundations of logic. And I probably learned as much uh, from Kelly as from anyone that I studied with in grad school. So, well, uh, hi Kelly, welcome to the Agora Cafe. Well, it's great to be here. So I was hoping that you would talk a little bit about uh, you know, your background uh, growing up, uh, how you got interested in, in philosophy, start off with some of that stuff. Sure. Um, I guess I got interested in philosophy because when I was in junior high, um, they decided to move me out of my junior high classes and let me take classes in high school. And I ended up, while I was, I guess, in eighth grade, taking the senior creative writing class. Um, and I really loved that class and fell in love with writing. And I really liked the woman who taught it, to whom I owe many debts. Her name was Faye Sauer. And the summer after that class, I was so sort of energized by the class that I wrote a collection of 50 essays that summer. And at the end of the summer, I went back to school and went back to Faye Sauer. And I had that uh, bunch of handwritten essays in my hand. I gave them to her. She came back to school the next day with them vetted and with a copy of Plato's Complete Dialogues. And she said, this is what you should be reading. And I read the first page of the Lysis and I thought, hey, that's what I should be reading. <laughs> and I pretty much decided then and there. I was the first friend. <laughs> that I would do, I would be a philosopher, although I wasn't, you know, perhaps entirely sure what that meant. I just knew that those pages of the Lysis did something for me that I desperately wanted done, but hadn't found in anything else before that. And so I started reading that book and um, she supplied me with other things to read. And, you know, that's how I, that's how I really got started. Um, I knew I wanted to do it. Uh, I ended up leaving high school early, didn't finish. I went on to college on an early admissions program to the College of Worcester, and they let me skip the introductory philosophy stuff and go right into the upper level classes. And I you know, just kind of never had any doubt that that's what I wanted to do. You know, that's what I wanted to, to study and to, to think about. I've had you know, doubts since then about exactly what I'm doing in it, but, uh, but I've never doubted that it was where I wanted to be. You can see also a little bit about about uh, where you're from, where you grew up. And sure. I grew up in southern Ohio uh, in a little town called Gallipolis, city of the Gauls. 
Uh, it's the second oldest city in Ohio, founded by a group of French who'd been swindled, uh, told that there was a place prepared for them uh, in, in the Ohio Valley. Uh, when they got there, there was no place prepared for them. Uh, and so they ended up just basically kind of pulling their boats out of the water at the confluence of the Ohio and Kanawha rivers and deciding, well, this is as good a place as any. And so- Growing up in Gallipoli often does have bad results. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it doesn't seem like the best possible plan. Um, at any rate, that was, the, that was the place. So it was a very small, very small community. The high school I went to, That's, I think- It's right were, behind me. <laughs> there were 27 people in my graduating class. Um, it was a, a rural uh, place. The nearest city of any consequence was Huntington, West Virginia a city of which almost no one knows. So calling it a city of consequence tells you something about where I really was, uh, just how isolated it was, but that's where I grew up. And you know, your family was into uh, bluegrass performance? Yeah, right? I grew up in a family of musicians. Uh, my father was a school teacher. In fact, uh, his mother was a school teacher. I'm the fifth generation teacher in the family. So it's a long family business, but he was, Though he was a school teacher, he was really a musician um, and played music uh, throughout my life. Uh, uh, played as professionally as a bluegrass player can play, uh, at least back in those days in the 50s and 60s. Uh, my brothers ended up becoming musicians too. Uh, and so it was a house full of, of music. Uh, uh, guitars and mandolins and uh, singing. So, uh, all right, so we got you as far as, as college, you're taking upper level classes in college, and then what's the? Um, so I took upper level classes in college, and though, and though, as I said, I never really questioned whether I wanted to do philosophy, I did sometimes wonder what I was doing in it. Um, and so that happened to me but that's a philosophical question. So you're, I know, you're, I know. So you're, you're still doing philosophy. <laughs> yeah, well, as Aristotle might say, it's not clear you can really get away from it. Um, but I, I, I actually began to think that there was something sort of artificial and stymieing about studying philosophy in the academy. Don't ask me why at 17, I thought I knew this, uh, but that's what I thought. I learned the truth at 17. <laughs> it didn't help, of course, that I'd, I'd gotten uh, Schopenhauer in my hands and read all of him early my freshman year of college and his hatred of Hegel and the academy undoubtedly had something to do with coloring my sense of things. At any rate, I thought, well, if I'm going to be a philosopher, a serious philosopher, I need to get out of the academy and actually live a life, uh, not this half life that academics lead. So I quit college, threw away my scholarships, uh, the whole business and decided I would join the Navy. Um, I ended up not going to the Navy, just decided a few weeks before I was due to go that I had made a mistake. My recruiter was luckily an honest man and told me that it was possible to get an official separation from the US government if I decided to go back to school since I joined a late entry. And so I did, I went back to school, but I didn't go back to Worcester. The professor who I liked best there had retired after I left. So I ended up going to Ohio University and studying there. Um, and I was there until I went to Rochester. So what was it like uh, studying at Rochester and working with Beck? Well, it was, it, was, it was terrific, although it was a strangely, maybe this is in some way a, a, an experience a lot of people have at different places, but it was a strangely kind of um, dualistic experience. On the one hand, I was spending a ton of time with Lewis White Beck, I was spending a lot of time with Deborah Modrak, you know, working in the history of philosophy, but I was also spending a lot of time with Richard Feldman and Earl Connie and other people who were doing sort of Chisholm style, you know, contemporary epistemology. And so the experience was you know, kind of odd. Uh, on the one hand, I was spending time, what does Swift call them? Ancient men in the corner spend their time with ancient things spending my time with the history of philosophy. And then the rest of the time I was trying to chisel away at S knows the P. Um, <laughs> and so that made for a kind of 
curious experience because it wasn't always clear to me how to fit those projects together, um, especially in a, in a sense, how to fit them together given the self-understanding of the sort of University of Massachusetts influenced epistemology I was being taught uh, uh, at the time. They were trying to bridge the gap. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, of course, there are people like, like Chisholm himself who were remarkably broad and, you know, interesting, but that side of the department at uh, Rochester, I mean, fine philosophers and, and you know, very good folks, but uh, they weren't much interested in recapturing for themselves anything like Chisholm's erudition or breadth. Uh, that just wasn't what they were interested in doing as philosophers. Yes, sir. But Beck, of course, the latest, was, latest iteration of proposition at yeah. you know, S prime prime can solve the problems that S prime didn't quite solve. Yeah. And then, of course, I had, you know, I was having coffee almost every morning with Lewis White Beck, and he was, of course, a kind of monster of erudition, a uh, <laughs> very different kind of philosopher, the kind of philosopher who, if you used an S and an asterisk in a paper, would say, now, Kelly, why are you disfiguring your prose? Um, <laughs> uh, and so it was, like I said, a, a very different kind of experience because those morning coffees were oriented on philosophy as an endeavor of a different kind in a way than the you know, afternoon epistemology classes often were. I've been telling people your Beck anecdotes for, for years. Remember the one about the, the tipic of practical reason? Do you remember that yeah. one? Yeah, we were in class one day and, and Beck was asking us about the tipic. And he said, so can anyone tell me what a tipic is? And of course, we all sat there in kind of stunned and consternated silence. And he looked around us and then finally a slow grin grew on his face and he said, well, boys and girls, there are dictionaries. And we all looked, of course, humbled now and chastened. And then he started laughing. He said, well, of course, you'll find it in none of them. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a fairly typical kind of exchange uh, with Beck. He was the kind of teacher who would turn to you and say, uh, Kelly, could you please reiterate for me the history of epistemology from Crucius to Hume? <laughs> <laughs> if, you know that were just a menu item that you could rattle off. <laughs> but he was a he was a wonderful teacher and a wonderful fellow. I I really I learned I learned a ton from him. Um, and he was maybe most strikingly just a, a remarkably humble man. Uh, I remember being in his class on the critique of practical reason. You know, here he is, the man who wrote the commentary on the critique of practical reason that stands to that critique in something like the relationship that Norman Kemp Smith's commentary stood, stands to, you know, the first critique and some willful graduate student is telling Beck, oh no, no, you don't know how to understand this. I'll show you how it goes. <laughs> Starts scribbling on the board and Beck's, Beck's sitting there looking at the board in like full expectancy of the, you know, the problem being solved, a problem that he just told us he'd spent 50 years trying to think through, but he really thought maybe this student would have it, you know, in a, in a few minutes in a few chalk streets, the answer would finally be before him. <laughs> and that was an attitude that he had kind of across the board. It was just, uh, and it was really, it was super encouraging for you as a student because you never felt like his erudition was, so to speak, in judgment of you. It was there to be drawn on, to be used, but never, never something he, as it were, standing on, looking down at you from. I told my students the other day, I'll tell you one last story. You probably remember this one, but I, it came up in my philosophy of religion class the other day, but I was talking to them about, uh, Beck's bad decision one day in a Nietzsche seminar to try to actually act out for us what a Quadney experiment was. You know, he was fascinated by Nietzsche's idea that metaphors are you know, to be explained by these Quadney experiments, the striking of a pitchfork and then holding it over a loose granular substance and the creation of a design, though there's no contact, the design and the substance. Uh, Nietzsche's metaphor for metaphors, if you think about it. Uh, and Beck decided to reenact that sort of experiment for us so we could all appreciate how good this was, this bit of Nietzsche. So he came into class with a, a green Folgers decaf can, empty, a piece of parchment paper, a big red rubber band, some talcum powder, and a, and a pitchfork. Uh, and so he pr proceeded to put the can down, put the parchment paper over it, tighten it into a drum with the rubber band, dump talcum powder on the top of the 
parchment paper. And then he picked up the pitchfork and without thinking what he was doing, struck the can itself a mighty blow. <laughs> and talcum powder went everywhere and covered Beck from head to foot. <laughs> and he stood there in the falling talcum powder and said, that did not work as I intended for it to work. <laughs> No, and maybe a good description of what sometimes goes wrong with Nietzsche, though. <laughs> it really might be. Yeah. Maybe it was just a bit of Nietzsche theater. <laughs> but yeah, he was terrific, a terrific teacher. Um, uh, okay, so uh, when you started teaching around upstate New York, was that while well, you were still studying at Rochester? or was yeah, I, was, I was at Rochester four years. That was my fourth year at Rochester. I got hired at SUNY Oswego uh, to teach some classes. And that was actually, for me, a kind of fateful thing because I ended up getting assigned um, an epistemology class to teach, but I wasn't given the choice of the text. The, I was hired because someone had fallen ill and the course had already kind of gotten started. And so I had to take over and I was left with the syllabi and the book choices that that particular person had made. and among the things that were chosen for that epistemology course was uh, Austin's Sense and Sensibilia. And I had you know, peeked into that book at times, perhaps even as Austin himself perhaps intended, <laughs> fooled into thinking I was looking for Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility. <laughs> but, uh, but I had never really given the book you know, any, any serious consideration. And teaching that book really kind of reoriented me philosophically. Uh, I went from there sort of on to, to Wittgenstein and other things that have been central to the you know, things I've worked on since. But that, uh, that time teaching that book was, was really, really important for me. And it wasn't you know, planned, it was really just sort of an accident. I just inherited this book and then started trying to teach it and found that, well, I guess you know, to put it in a way that say Stanley Cavell might put it, I suddenly found my voice philosophically. I felt like I had something to say. I knew where to enter a comment in a way that didn't always feel to me as often had been the case in graduate school, like I was just sort of chattering from the edges. Um, you know, I felt like I was actually speaking to something, uh, to someone uh, in trying to think about what Austin was doing. So when did you get interested in Wittgenstein? How soon after that? Well, um, it was around the same time because around that same time, I ended up, uh, as one of the final courses I took at Rochester, taking a Wittgenstein class with Dennis O'Brien, who was uh, then president of the university, but also a member of the philosophy department. And I took that course, I guess I took about half that course. Um, and then I ended up having to drop out of it because my son was born, he was sick. Uh, and so I actually wouldn't complete that course until a couple of years later when I submitted my first published paper on Wittgenstein as my paper for that course. Um, that was sort of how I ended up finishing, finishing that class. But that class came on sort of the heels of the Austin and you know, had, a, had another really uh, impactful, uh, was really impactful for me. And then I got started teaching the next fall here at Auburn and I was reading Uncertainty and teaching Descartes, and I mentioned some passages from Uncertainty to students, and a bunch of students stayed after class and asked me if I'd be willing to read that book outside of class with them. And I said I would, and that was really, that was really when I began to work seriously, I think, on Wittgenstein. It wasn't the investigations, actually, that got me. It was Uncertainty. Uh, and I suppose that's because I kind of came into ordinary language philosophy as it was you know, then thought of came in through the epistemological door, as it were, through sense and sensibilia, through uncertainty. So let's see, am I, am I missing any major steps along the way between- oh, You've got me here and, and Auburn. Here, here I've been. Uh, <laughs> since. Yeah. Some of our more eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed a slight discontinuity in the video at this point. Uh, the reason for which is that I had cleverly managed to steer the conversation in the direction of uh, Kelly's time teaching at SUNY Oswego, uh, but then I got myself off track because I was going to ask about a certain anecdote 
uh, from his time at Oswego and said I ended up asking a question about Wittgenstein and that took us uh, farther afield. But I managed to lure uh, Kelly back in here and I will uh, insert uh, uh, this anecdote seamlessly into the rest of our interview. So, Kelly, you you have an anecdote about Oswego. Please, uh, please tell it. Yeah. I, so when I taught there, um, one of the things I found out, I mean, I'd been told it, but it was one of those things you don't really fully understand until you've lived through it. Uh, Oswego is basically a dumping ground for lake effect snow, and so it's a place that sometimes gets an enormous amount of snowfall in almost no time. Uh, one day, in fact, I was driving from Rochester over to Oswego to teach and snow began to fall and to fall more quickly than I'd ever seen snow fall. The ground went from snowless to completely snowbound in just, it seemed, minutes. And the windshield of my car, for all intents and purposes, was, was like someone had taped white construction paper to it. I parked, got out of the car, and promptly walked into a telephone pole, uh, and then understood why people die in blizzards. Uh, but one of the things that was really funny about Oswego that I discovered on this particular snowy day, one of the few days, by the way, in Oswego's history, I think, where they actually canceled school because of snow, it was that bad. But it turned out there were ropes tied from the dining hall all the way to the doors of the various dorms on campus. And the reason for this was because I was told at any rate, in the past, in particularly snowy conditions, students had left their dorms intending to get something to eat at the dining hall, wandered out onto the lake and froze to death. <laughs> and so they tied these ropes on, on campus, which made it seem very spiderweb-like uh, so that people could find their way in the blinding snow. Uh, from building to dining hall. Thank you. That's the anecdote I wanted. Uh, I love the I love the background. I think it'll really aid the seamul the seamlessness of the transition. <laughs> Thanks, Rod. Thank you. I'll now say I'll say goodbye to present Kelly and return us to uh, past Kelly. Yeah. Um. Uh, so um, you know, as I mentioned, your you. Know, uh, you know your range of, of research interests is is uh, pretty broad. Although I, I think I see threads connecting any of them. Um, you now, so can you say a little bit about just some of the, you know, wh whatever of the research that you've done in the last few decades that sort of you find particularly, you know, you feel particularly inclined to you know to say something about. Sort of yeah. a vague open-ended question, but yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, at the at the center in many ways of of what I've been interested in um, are those three principles that Frege, you know, provides in the preface to the Foundations of Arithmetic, right? Uh, you know, always to separate the logical from the psychological, the um, uh, yeah, I always separate the logical from the psychological, the subjective from the objective. Never ask for a word except the meaning of a word, except in the context of a proposition, and always sharply to separate concept and object. I mean, in many ways, if you think about it, almost everything I've done as a philosopher is in a way related to one of those three statements. Uh, my concern with psychologism is, if you think about it, caught up in the first. It's also caught up in various ways in the second and the third, too, but that's no surprise since on my understanding, those three fr principles of Frege's are such that each presupposes the other two. Um, and so, you know, my, my, way of, uh, my way of thinking about ordinary language philosophy, again, so-called, is you know, deeply uh, influenced by that context principle, which I think, you know, deeply influenced Austin and deeply influenced Wittgenstein. Uh, and then the always to separate concept and object, I mean, that's the particular piece of Frege that I've leaned on hardest. You know, I've been the sort of odd reader. Well, that's, that's what your, you know, your Frege slash Wittgenstein book. Yes, uh, it's the really a concept horse book. Yeah, it's really, it's really concerned centrally with that, with that particular line. Um, and, you know, I'm the odd kind of 
reader of Frege who you know, thinks that the concept object distinction, for instance, is much more interesting and much more fruitful than this sense reference distinction is. Um, not that I think that that's not an important distinction, but you know, my. But yeah, my, that, that one me, has gotten more, you know, more attention, more. Uh, gotten a lot more attention. And I think in some ways it, it doesn't go nearly as deep into the structure of Frege's thinking as the distinction between concept and object does. So lots of my work has in a way revolved around those three principles. Um, even you know, the work I've done in say continental philosophy and so on has often for me been a way of trying to think about those sorts of issues. For instance, when I'm reading someone like Heidegger, I'm almost, almost always reading him as someone who was himself a reader of Husserl and deeply influenced by Husserl's anti-psychologism. And so, you know, I'm really, really deeply interested in phenomenology, but as much as anything, I'm interested in it as a way of trying to sort of de-psychologize psychology, um, a way of trying to think about the mind that doesn't fall into the pitfalls of psychologizing it. Yeah. And some of our viewers will be more hip to these concepts than others. Could you say, for those who aren't, could you say a little bit about yeah. what the three rules of Frege are, are about and what's motivating them? Yeah, well, Frege, Frege as I said, he states these three rules uh, toward the end of the preface of the Foundations of Arithmetic, and the rules come up um, in important ways in the unfolding of that brief text. So you know, there, are, there are central sections where, for instance, the so-called context principle, which is the second of the three principles, never ask for the meaning of a word, except in the context of a proposition. There are places where you know, Frege will invoke that explicitly and try to show you what it means. Um, he thinks it's, it's, it's a really important principle when you're trying to do what he tells you to do in the first principle, or for instance, he says, always to separate the logical from the psychological, because in Frege's brief comments about how to think about the three principles, one of the things he says is that the important, one of the reasons the context principle is important is because it helps you to see that the meaning of a word can't be, for instance, an image in the mind, you know, that props up, as it were, as the word is you know, thought of. And uh, he thinks that that's crucial because if you give into the idea that the meaning of a word is, for instance, an image in the mind, then you are failing to keep the first principle. You're allowing the logical and the psychological to mix with one another. You're allowing the objective and the subjective to mix with one another because Frege thinks whatever meaning is, it's not a psychological item. It's not an item in a subjective economy. That's not the right way to understand it. And so keeping the context principle, never asking for the meaning of a word except in the context of a principle is a way, among many other things, but it's a way, Frege thinks, of sort of bridling yourself. Because when you allow yourself to ask for the meaning of a word outside the context of a proposition, it's almost always going to be the case that your performance, say, of speaking the word will be accompanied by some mental picture. I mean, it doesn't have to go that way, but it almost always is that way. I mean, if you don't think so, just talk to intro students and ask them, and they'll report this experience to you uh, reliably. And, uh, and, they'll, and they'll almost always pick a noun. Oh, yes, always pick a noun. As, you know, as Wittgenstein sort of complains at the very beginning of the investigations. Exactly, yeah. And you know, we, we just- Somewhat unfairly against Augustine, since Augustine was actually more, more nuanced about this, but I don't know whether, whether Wittgenstein that. read on the teacher or not, or whether he just read that. Yeah, chapter for sure, read that. Because yeah. if you read on the teacher, you say, all right, Wittgenstein is, I mean, Augustine is sort of sensitive to this worry of treating, acting as though all words are nouns and treating each word as, as carrying its meaning and virtue of, of a mental picture of the thing it stands for, which, you know, yeah. might initially look plausible if you're talking about, you know, tree and car and cat. Um, but when you're getting to the and if and. Yeah. Uh, of course, William James famously right. said William the, James, the word you, you know that the word you know the word if stands for a feeling of uncertainty, uh, kind of, okay. which kind just, of you just seems to have forgotten the you know the range of uses we actually use the word if in like um, you know if I say well you know yeah because we often say things like um, uh, well you know. If you're here now, the party must really be starting or something like that. Well, I'm not in any doubt as to whether they're no. there now. No, there's really no iffiness about it. 
that he uh, might say in that particular case, uh, in the, the sense of iffy that James has in mind. There's a kind of yeah. philosophical desperation to try and come up with, you know, to make, to make the word if stand for a feeling. And then, of course, that's that famous paper on feeling William James's butt with a, right. the title is the best part of that paper. But <laughs> paper. In fact, I, had, I commented on the man who wrote that paper, a paper of his before he wrote that paper, trying to sort of explain to him the sort of rampant psychologizing that led to that paper. But uh, I'm afraid uh, my words fell on deaf ears. Yeah, I mean, the, the title, when you see the title, you think it's going to be a parody of yeah. William James's position, but it actually ends up conceding much more to James on that point than, than one would have hoped. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's right. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that Frege helps you see, and of course, Wittgenstein, too, is concerned with this, putting this in Frege's terminology, you know, Frege distinguished between what he called the, the saturated and the unsaturated parts of propositions. But it's amazing, I think, how easy it is to fall into the idea that the, you know, the so-called saturated parts of propositions are just saturated on their own. You know, if you represent the unsaturated parts with empty parentheses, I know this is a little so technical, but this is how Frege thought about it. So, you know, in like silver is a horse, silver is so to speak the saturated part, blank is a horse is the unsaturated part. It's unsaturatedness <clears throat> is represented by the empty parentheses. And it's easy, when, and you see this happen with students all the time when you try to teach them this. It's easy for them to look at that and think, oh, but I get it. Saturated terms are just saturated on their own. They don't think of saturated as being a term that, you know, as it were, stands in intimate relationship with unsaturated. It's a contrast. You yeah, know, you so it's like, I mean, it's easy to see, it's easy to see that blank is a horse isn't a complete thought because there's a blank. Yeah. Um, but, you know, but, um, uh, you, know, you know, silver, uh, uh, you know, as considered as a name, um, just as a as a noun or as a as a proper noun, uh, it's easy to think that that has a meaning just on its own. Of course, it's true that you know the way it works is different from the way that the, yes. the other things work. But you know, if you just go around and say nouns, I mean, of course, given the right context, just going yeah. around and say that, nouns or slab to take given, given the right context is in a way a way of sneaking parentheses in. <laughs> yeah, or but like them. But uh, yeah, if you just say silver. What about it? Uh, you know, you haven't actually, you haven't actually asserted a, a complete thought. The um, the noun is, um, you know, the function of a noun uh, depends on the various kinds of of you know of of non nouns it can productively hook up with, and the functions of the non nouns function you know depend on the the nouns it can they can productively hook up with. And so, like, so that's this idea that the you know it has to be something more like a complete sentence or statement has to be the bearer of the meaning and the the individual words it, it, because you know there's this you know the idea that Frege and Wittgenstein as you know but I'm sort of helping to explain this to my readers there's this idea that the meaning of sentences my viewers not my readers the meanings of sentences are built up from the meanings of the words the words each have individual meanings and they carry their full fledged meaning on their own and then you put them together like Lego blocks and the meaning of the whole sentence yes. is to derive from the meanings of the words. Um, and, you know, that can look more plausible in some cases than others. You know, uh, you know grass is green. You can think, all right, grass, we well, picture some grass. Green, you picture a field of greenness. Is, well, you're not quite sure what to picture for the is. So maybe you picture some sort of you ghostly, ghostly link between the grass and the green. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, but you know, once you have got to start getting anything more, I mean, you know, strictly speaking, it doesn't even work at that level, but you can see how it could be, yeah. uh, you know, appealing at that level. But once you think about any sort of complex sentence, like, uh, you know, uh, well, if this grass is green, uh, you know, whatever else might be green, uh, or something like that, you know, you've got a whole bunch of words there that don't seem to carry little pictures on their own. Um, yeah. Whatever else might be, you know, what do you picture? Um, you know, it, it, maybe okay. William James would be able to heroically come up with some kind of sensation for whatever else it might, you, whatever else might, it might, might be sort of, might makes right to some sort of strong power or it might be the sort of this feeling of possibility, but, but um, you know, uh, you know, 
just try forming a proposition by you know getting a feeling of possibility or a feeling of uncertainty yeah. and gluing exactly. them together and you just get sort of a a symphony of vague unease <laughs> but you haven't actually asserted anything well indiscriminately off color um <laughs> yeah it's it's you know one of the things i like to point out to students just to get them thinking about this i'm not saying it's you know a knock on drive out proof or something but it certainly is a powerful moment for students often is just to get them to open up the page of the dictionary and then just to say well look at the entries you know is every word a noun aren't there many words for which there are you know multiple entries across parts of speech how do you figure out which part of speech a word is when the word in isolation is just on a page in front of you, you know, mark well i mean that could be a name it could be a verb you know, it could be a noun it could be a verb what do you, you know, what do you it could be an imperative yeah it could be all kinds of things and you know just getting students to sort of start there is a way of trying to get them to see past something like the the sort of blinding familiarity of nouns <laughs> uh their inability to kind of look past them uh the kind of thing that again as you were saying Wittgenstein is worried about right in the opening passages of the investigations yeah so I'm just, I'll just say it for my viewers he at the beginning of the investigations uh he quotes this passage from Augustine from the confessions for Augustine's describing how he learned language as a child and he says basically you know you know my elders pointed at things and said the names of them tree dog etc and so that's how i learned um uh which is not obviously not going to be helpful for understanding uh you know the difference say between uh a noun like runner and a verb like runs you know you point point at both things are you pointing someone who's running are you talking are you just mean runner or runs or or whatever and obviously it's completely unuseful for uh you know for the ifs and the thes and the uh buts and the ands uh you know and then you know, as i mentioned earlier uh you know augustine's more is more sensitive to this worry than you might think from just from that passage that wittgenstein quotes in the beginning of the confessions because augustine has another work on the teacher de magistro uh where he quotes this line of poetry or something like you know if if of so great a city nothing be left uh i think that is, is it something like that is the line he quotes and uh you know so there's you know the only thing you could really try to run the picture theory on is city yeah. there but if of nothing what does nothing stand for does it stand for nothingness a vast <laughs> void and if and of and so and great and be and left i uh, uh, did um so it's an inspired choice it's a really great example yeah so uh you yeah, know augustine was uh, was was sharper than because they give him credit for of course that doesn't change the fact that his example in the confessions is you know is less than helpful and uh, i don't think as you know i don't think wittgenstein's real point there is to you know pound away on augustine he it was a handy example of and it, and it was important because it was said from Wittgenstein's point of view it was important because it was said first by Augustine but also because it was said in a kind of offhand gee shucks this must be true sort of way mm -hmm. you know again uh, Augustine might have had more sober thoughts or second more second thoughts but I think Wittgenstein thought it was really he, Wittgenstein always thought it was particularly important when something that looked like a philosophical confusion arose in just sort of ordinary context ordinary life uh you know, he was always fascinated by, for instance, detective films and how sometimes philosophical problems would come up in detective films. Uh, and he thought it was very important that they came up there. Um, I remember he has some passage where he talks about some detective story in which, um, not a film, but a written story in which, you know, some of the, the, the characters musing about time and, yes. and the, the moments of the clock and about how, you know, maybe time doesn't really exist. Um, without any real motivation for what's going on here it's just some it's just some bit of philosophical uh wisdom or or wisdom that has lodged itself in this in this person's uh, mind right. and you know and there are lots of doctrines that are sort of really philosophical doctrines and often perhaps dubious ones that that just seem to be generally accepted like you just the other day I, uh in class um in my uh uh in my philosophy east and west class i'm talking about the the dispute of between representational realists and direct realists about perception in Indian philosophy and the debates look very much like the ones 
the ones in Western philosophy. Uh, and I mentioned that to many people nowadays, representational realism just seems like common sense. Um, although at one time, direct realism did. But now representational realism did because people, it's just something that people have grown up. It's not necessarily common sense in the sense of the way they actually relate to their own ordinary experience because they usually think that they are actually seeing, seeing their friends regularly rather than just seeing images of their friends. But it's something that they think has been established by, you know, photons and science to, to yeah. quote our, our, yeah. our old so friend Bill Davis. Say, we live in an age of popular science and it's always a bad time for thinking. <laughs> Um, and you know, the idea that, well, of course, there's all kinds of causally intermediary stuff going on between the, the thing that you are perceiving and your perception of it. Um, it doesn't mean that you, that you perceive the thing by perceiving any of the links in that chain. Um, but you know, just to a lot of students, it just seems this, this representational way of thinking just seems natural because it's a bit of it's a bit of sort of quasi philosophical uh, uh, lore that they just you know they pick, that they were they learned in uh, you know that they learned it you know, maybe in school. It's not even the most pernicious one. I mean, the whole fact versus opinion one maybe the yeah, most. That's the worst one. Yeah, pernicious one. <laughs> I had a student in the doorway of my office a couple of years ago who was you know kind of wonderful living illustration of the thing you're talking about. He and I were talking about basically representational and direct realist issues, and he just could not understand why I thought there was any question about the representational story. And I finally just looked at him. He was standing maybe 15 feet from me. I was back in my office near the bookshelf, and he was at the doorway. And I said, so where am I? And he went. And that traveling of his finger from pointing at where I was to pointing at his own head, you know, in a way captures just exactly what's going on with students so often. Well, that's sort of, I mean, if he thinks that you're in there, then I think he's, go, he's going beyond representational realism. Yeah. The next yeah. step. Yeah. Which yeah. happens in Indian philosophy too. There, you know, the, um, you know, the Buddhists get pressured from direct realism to representational realism to a kind of phenomenalism um, by a kind of uh, objective tendency of the problematic, so to speak. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's certainly, that was really true of this student who couldn't sort those positions out. And that, like I said, that, that eloquent movement of his pointed finger was <laughs> an illustration of his, of his profoundly disquieted state of philosophical mind. Where's the hand? <laughs> Where's the goddamn hand? <laughs> but you don't often get, you know, something epitomized for you so clearly uh, in philosophy as that, as that did, uh, that particular student's confusions. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you think about the, about Wittgenstein's, you know, there seems to be some disagreement about the extent to which Wittgenstein was aware of or engaged with, you know, much of the history of philosophy. Because in some views, he just seems to have, have just junked the whole thing as, as garbage and ignored it. But there are other views according to which he was sort of kind of uh, aware of at least parts of it and, and sort of engaged with it, but just didn't always talk that much about it. Do you have any views on that? Because obviously you are a lot more engaged with history of philosophy explicitly yeah. than Wittgenstein was. Yeah, um, I mean, there's that, there's that great line of, of Stanley Cavell's where he says, you know, the, the two greatest philosophers of the 20th century each cultivated a myth about himself. Wittgenstein that he'd read no philosophy and Heidegger that he'd read it all. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, Wittgenstein, I think a lot of times students of Wittgenstein's, I mean, of course they were overwhelmed by his personality. I, you know, I'm in many ways kind of glad I never knew the man. <laughs> uh, but I, I, he, was, he was someone who sort of insisted on what you might call naked confrontations of personalities. I think Isaiah Berlin or somewhere, somewhere uses a phrase like that, talking about Wittgenstein. And, you know, you go to his rooms and there'd be no books, no pictures, nothing, just two chairs. And you'd sit to talk with him and it's like, you know, okay, this is it. There's nothing to talk about except us. Here we are. An avant-garde play, no props. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that, that that feature of his probably added to the kinds of things he would sometimes say about the history of philosophy, you know, made it seem as though you know, he really did philosophize as it were without books around. It was all just being spun out of his head. Um, you know, he would complain to Geech about dragging, you know, dragging uh, uh, the Assyrians into the discussion. 
<laughs> because Geach would always want to bring, Peter Geach would always want to bring pieces of the history of philosophy into Wittgenstein's discussion, and Wittgenstein was not in a hurry for that to happen. But I think that, you know, if you know Wittgenstein's history, you know that he certainly was influenced by philosophers like Schopenhauer. Uh, he'd read Schopenhauer. He later kind of repented of having read Schopenhauer. Uh, but he had read Schopenhauer, and, and Schopenhauer clearly left an impact on the pages of the Tractatus. Um, and, you know, though he hadn't maybe... And perhaps on this general cheery disposition. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. The old woman is dead, the dead is paid. They both had that kind of disposition. <laughs> Obidanus, nanit, abidonus. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, 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 do think he, I do think he cultivated this image of himself as sort of free of the history of philosophy in many ways. I, I think that there's something to be said for a certain kind of independence from the history of philosophy, a uh, certain kind of you know, willingness to, to sort of try to start over. You know, Frederick Weissman once tried to get Wittgenstein to write a book with him, and he said it turned out to be impossible because every time they met, Wittgenstein start, wanted to start writing it again. You know, just start over uh, every time. And of course, you're never going to get anywhere like that. But that's, that was Wittgenstein. He was sort of an eternal beginner, I think, in a way, in philosophy. And so he, you know, he had a hard time seeing himself as, as you know, climbing, as it were, on the, onto the shoulders of others. But he knew that he did. Um, when you look at culture and value, that collection of, of remarks of his, you know, there are numerous places where he, he kind of cycles through people who've left an impact on his thinking. And of course, there are philosophers among them. There are also people we wouldn't ordinarily think of you know, as philosophers among them, composers and other people who, who he thought of as making a mark on his thinking. But his thinking, let's put it this way, was certainly very culturally alive, very culturally influenced, uh, uh, very acculturated. Uh, he was a man, despite all his attempts to denude his room of any culture, he was a man of high culture in many ways. <laughs> um, uh, and that's something, again, I think it's easy to forget about him, uh, but was true, you know, true of him. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I've never been a huge fan of the sort of, uh, of the of the view of him that says you know he hated the history of philosophy I think that's not true you know when when Malcolm suggested that he called philosophical investigations just philosophy Wittgenstein you know sort of had a fit you know, how could I possibly you know use that word that's meant so much in the history of human beings you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think you know his attitude was was interestingly complicated and of course you know he 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 read Augustine. He loved he loved the Confessions. Uh, he'd read enough of the dialogues to know how to complain about them. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know the idea. Yeah, and, you know, and the little the little phrases in Wittgenstein that are often seem to be borrowed from Augustine or Plato or somewhere, and often he'll sort of twist them on their heads or something. Yeah. Not sure that's a well, yeah, that we've been we've been abusing William James, but. Uh, uh, you know, Wittgenstein often began his, his classes at Cambridge by reading from Principles of Psychology, a uh, book that he, you know, he liked. And of course, he'd read Varieties of Religious Experience over and over again, um, a book that he, he really well, loved. James has his better moments and his worst moments. There's no doubt about it. No, um, I mean, that's true of us all, but. <laughs> it is true of us all. Uh, but, but James is, yeah, James is sort of all over the map, you know, in many ways. I mean, I, I, I really admire James in lots of ways for all that I also deeply disagree with him about many things. But I often, as you know, teach him in various classes because I think he is a philosophy, a philosopher who writes in such a, an engaging and interesting way. And he wrote for a public that's so different than the public for which people write these days and certainly very different from the audience, shifting terms here, for which philosophers write these days. You know, my students in philosophy of religion are just now beginning to reckon with how educated the educated public James was writing for was compared to the people they know. You know, and so I keep telling them, well, this isn't very technical. And they're like, but I have to use the dictionary to understand it. Well, I didn't say it was dumbed down. I said it wasn't technical. <laughs> Those are two different things. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And of course, they, you, know, uh, you know, educated writers often freely peppered their you know, their texts with, uh, with uh, Latin or Greek. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, and French, of, of course, uh, you know, 
everyone assumed everyone knew French and Latin, and you know, if they were lucky, they would know Greek as well. Yeah. Um, so you, know, you didn't translate those things. It would just, just be uh, it would be condescending to translate. Them. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, our students have this interestingly related attitude. I don't look them up because it would be work to look them up. <laughs> So he didn't condescend and-, and There are dictionaries, boys and girls. Yeah, there are dictionaries, boys and girls. <laughs> you won't find it there. <laughs> well, not in the English dictionaries anyway. No, not in the English ones anyway. Well, of course, you know, a lot of your research interests, uh, you mentioned Wittgenstein being interested both in people you traditionally think of as philosophers and people you might think of as not so much philosophers, but sort of various cultural, you know, other producers of other kinds of cultural products, but your own work has sort of you know, spread the gamut across those yeah. uh, those things. Yeah, you know, in many ways, I, I mean, I suppose you know, a long time ago, I, I, I ran, ran across that line. I, I may be misremembering it. In fact, perhaps I've turned it into a motto in a misremembered form, but there's some place where Cavell talks about um, a certain kind of loyalty to your own experience. And I, I don't know, I guess I kind of took that to heart in what I've done. I've, I've tried to allow myself to, to take the things I take seriously, seriously enough to try to understand why I take them seriously, you know, why I would care about them, uh, to try to find you know, something like articulate reasons for items of, of popular culture or music or whatever it might be that I, you know, that I care about and that I find instructive and maybe even instructive in a way that I want to call philosophical without necessarily trying to apply that term to the producer you know, of that thing, the creator of that thing. On your blog, you just finished up a, uh, uh, a discussion of just finishing up a rereading of a bunch of Jane Austen. Yeah. Yeah, I reread Austen pretty much every summer. I guess I sort of like a uh, like Ryle, Ryle was asked once if he read novels, and he said, yes, all six every year. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's sort of my attitude. I've reread Austen every summer since I was 20-something, I guess. Um, and, you know, I've, I've found her uh, tremendously interesting. In fact, I just, just today, and I, I set up my spring 4970 course here at Auburn as a course on Austen and the grammar of morality. So I'm going to do a class on, on Austen, taking seriously the idea that Ryle has in that great essay of his on Jane Austen and the moralists, that Austen approaches as he puts it from the south side, what a philosopher's approach from the north side. <laughs> uh, so trying to think about Austen in conjunction with Aristotle and Aquinas and Samuel Johnson, and trying to read some of the best of Austen criticism that often focuses on the way she understands the moral life, the kind of challenge and moral challenges that her, her you know, characters are facing. Because of course, the, the novels aren't really just about uh, you know, women trying to get married. Uh, there's something going on about that all the time, of course, but uh, that becomes really just you know, the, the venue in which all of, this, all of this moral stuff happens. And Austin's ability to to you know, delineate all that in a particularly fine way, uh, to track characters across time and conversations in ways that are revelatory of their virtues and vices and of their changes from virtue to vice or vice to virtue, and so on. All that I think is really, really instructive. And so i um, looking forward to you know, teaching that class and seeing what students have to say about it. In the last interview uh, I did with, uh, with my friend Gary Chartier, we were talking about and re remembering the, uh, the great exchange in uh, Whit Stillman's film, Metropolitan, where uh, one of the characters is a big fan of Jane Austen, the other one is, is severely critical, and as they go on talking, it turns out that the critical one has never actually read Austen. But he says, well, uh, you know, I don't see any need to, you know, to read the works when I can just read good literary criticism instead. At least in reading literary criticism, I you know I can avoid that feeling. I always get reading fiction that the author has just made it all up. <laughs> I've forgotten that scene, yeah. But yeah, yeah. which yeah, St Stillman's sympathies are clearly with Austin. You know, I mean, a lot of you know, a lot of that film just you know feels like an updated version of an Austin film in some ways. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It does, 
and and I do think Austin has suffered, you know, about as much as any any novelist has from a certain kind of preconception. I mean, part of it is that there are things she said that are, I think, often taken out of context and then you know said over and over again, like her bit about you know two inches of ivory, you know, being as it were the the scope she needed to do her novels. And the idea seems to be for most people who hear that that you know, you couldn't upon those two inches of ivory inscribe anything of great importance in human life. You know, all you could They're do- They're not familiar with nanotechnology. <laughs> yeah, and in a way, you know, Austin was the early and early nanotechnologist. <laughs> I, mean, I think Austin's, you know, when Austin writes to uh, it's uh, a relative and says, you know, three or, four country, three or four families in a country town, that's just the thing. What she means isn't, Oh, that's all I can control as an artist. What she means is everything that I could possibly care about will happen there if I arrange it the right way, you know, make it up. Uh, but you know, I can get I can get sort of the whole panoply of human life and human nature, you know, shown uh, in that three or four families in that country town. Um, and I think she, you know, you know, it, it provides ample opportunities for various kinds of virtue and vice, wisdom and folly, learning, yeah. Yeah. refusals to learn. Well, as I like to tell students, you know, I, I'm like, look, you know, that, that scene in Emma on Box Hill is in many ways, you know, in the context of an Emma novel, like as fraught with significance as what happens on Little Round Top is at Gettysburg. You know, I mean, but, you, you know, if you can't see that, you can't see what Austin's doing. I mean, Emma's undoing happens on Box Hill, you know, uh, and it's crucially important that it happens there. It happens in the way that it does, you know, her mortification. Uh, and her correction by by Knightley, all that is you know the major event in the novel is 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 there you know any sound of cannon, you know or any any screaming charge? No, but it's certainly fraught. Actually, I have, I will somewhat egocentrically uh, inflict on you and on my uh, uh, on my viewers a poem I wrote a few years back that makes a. Similar point, don't worry, it's very short. Um, it's called After the Apocalypse. No radioactive rubble smokes beneath the broken moon. No armies of marauding mutants rampage across the desolate earth. And yet today is after the apocalypse. For the apocalypse comes to each of us privily, and the man sitting beside you may be struggling for survival in a devastated world, yet not a ripple mars the surface of his visage. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's right. And privily, uh, even a kind of happy Austinian sounding word. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I think that's, that, that, that's right, Roderick. I think that, and I do think that is, that is Austin's understanding of what she's doing. The idea is, look, you know, what's happening here is, is, so to speak, in a sense, as, as full of human significance, these betrayals are as full of significance as any betrayal on a larger political you know, stage mm -hmm. would be. I mean, maybe there are fewer people, in a sense, caught in its field of consequences, but that doesn't make it any less a betrayal than it, mm -hmm. it is. The body count is maybe lower, but... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Certainly it was lower at Box Hill than it was at Little Round Top. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But of course, on the other hand, you know, the number of box hills in our lives is greater than the number of little round tops. And so and, and I do think that's that's also very, very important to Austin. You know, that that's one of the things that she's trying to get us to understand is how how often in the context of a regular day we have these moments where, you know, we could be beside the person who's in a desolate landscape and we just have no clue. Uh, or we find ourselves in one and can do nothing to help ourselves, you know, about it. I think that is, you know, the kind of thing that she's really concerned with uh, and why she thinks that three or four families in a country town is adequate for showing what she's interested in showing. Yeah, well, since I've, been, I've uh, inflicted one of my poems on, on us, I should, I will remind us that you, uh, you have a relatively recent uh, uh, volume of poetry of your own. Do you want to say a little bit about how you got into uh, and doing that and how and the connections you see between um, your poetic work and your philosophic work? Because in the afterward to that, you make clear that you do see 
Yeah, uh, yeah, connection. I think it's connected. Um, yeah, I, I've been interested in poetry for a long time, written at it for a long time. I have uh, the book of poems that you mentioned. I have a, another book finished. I just haven't, haven't really done anything with it yet. Um, but for me, and, and there's actually, as you know, a, a poem in that, in that first book, Stony Lonesome, that's largely concerned with Frege. Um, and partly is concerned with Frege because of the disparaging things about poetry that Frege had to say. Um, well, maybe disparaging is a little strong, but at any rate. By the way, I assume that the comma after uh, between OK and Bausma is deliberate in one of those poems? Yes, it is deliberate. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, uh, the, the reason why I mention, I mention Frege is because I, 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 I tend to think that one of the things that makes poetry of of deep interest is the way in which something like logical syntax is so much a part of what it is. You know, poetry isn't the, the abandoning of logical syntax. It's something like the exploitation of logical syntax for all you can possibly get from it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that makes poetry in many ways a deeply logical kind of endeavor. I mean, I, I recognize that I'm courting paradox with that phrasing. But I do think it's a deeply logical kind of activity. And I think it's, it's also a use of language that's really interesting to reflect on from a kind of Phrygian or a Wittgensteinian perspective. You know, what is going on? And Wittgenstein says, you know, for a large class of cases, but not for all, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. You know, did he have its use in poetry in mind? Or would that have been excluded? Or was that among the things he had in mind? You know, it's, I think, interesting to think about that and so um, a lot of a lot of my interest in poetry is in a way an interest in in language and in its possibilities um, you know, what you can do with a word you know the the magic of enjambment and things of that sort uh, fascinate me uh, and so I, I don't really think of it as you know time spent so to speak away from philosophy, although I don't think of it as philosophizing as such, but I do think that much that I care about as a philosopher carries over you know, into what I'm thinking about uh, when, I'm, when I'm writing poetry. Um, and so it's also, and I guess I, I will say this, just kind of slightly different tack on this. It's also for me always been a useful thing just because it's helpful to get out of the kind of posture you have to be in to write philosophy uh, and to take up a different posture, you know, the sort that you, you know, take up when you're writing poetry. Uh, find yourself in a venue in which each word is, in a sense, just as fraught as it is in philosophy, but now fraught in a new way. Um, you know, there's a different set of, of conventions and a different set of of criteria guiding choice and so on. And that's, for me at any rate, helpful because I sometimes really need to just stop hearing philosophy in my head. And it's like, okay, enough, you know, F.H. Bradley, let's read T.S. Eliot. Um, though that's a bad example since of course, Bradley was a huge influence on Eliot. Um, it's hard to read Eliot without hearing F.H. Bradley as a matter of fact. Well, since we've touched on Two of the books, one was just a little bit about the third, about Chuck, in which I confess I have not read the Chuck book yet because you say it right at the beginning, don't read this unless you've watched the show. Yeah. There are like 90 episodes or something of the show and I haven't watched any of them yet. So sure enough to get it to 100 to, to allow it to be um, you know, shown again on t uh, regular TV. Uh, yeah, uh, I wrote that book. Um, I got taken by that show, I was at home sick and just started watching it on Netflix. I'd, I'd seen the first couple of episodes, I think, when they came out, but that was back when I was department chair and you know my kids were still pretty young and I was just super busy uh, and I lost track of the show. And so I started watching it that day sick on the couch and it just kind of overwhelmed me. There were lots of things about it that interested me. I mean, among them was the way in which the, the problem of other minds is central to the show. Uh, I mean, if you think about spy shows, it's not that hard to see that that's going to be true. But Chuck, I think, worries that problem more in a way, maybe because it has 90 some episodes, 
worries that problem more than a lot of a lot of things of that sort do and keeps coming back to it and coming back to it in ways that I find um, rich and interesting because it's for instance the show doesn't just pose the question of other minds that you might think of as the sort of spectatorial question you know how do I know that 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 moving body is minded but it asks what you might think of as the agential question how can I make my own mind known or what do I have to do to keep my own mind from being known uh, that question, I think, is I really. Think Colin McGinn, in his book on Shakespeare, says talks about that as a quite, big, quite major question in Othello. Yeah, uh, because Iago's trying to keep his mind from being known. Desdemona is desperately trying to make her mind known, uh, yes. and so the difficulties involved in both. In fact, I have a paper on that, uh, yeah. which you may have read. I don't remember. I don't know if I have. You need to. You should put it in my mailbox. It could happen. Yeah, at any rate, I, that that really interests me. The Sarah character in the show, the the spy character, is a character who you know has, in a sense, not been known, in a sense, never known, and who's I think in many ways in despair of being known, but also terrified of the consequences of being known. You know, all very Shakespearean in its way, uh, and the show does a really interesting job of thinking about that. At any rate, I got really caught up in, in that. I got really caught up in what I think of as the show's thoroughgoing contra, contrapuntal structure, uh, the way its episodes are united with one another, not just through, you know, like uh, temporal relations or causal relations, but also through structural, formal, meaningful relations. Um, all that really caught my attention. And so I got kind of excited about the show. Um, I sat down and wrote a blog post about it. And then I stood up and my wife was asking me what I was doing and I told her I'd written this blog post about the show and she said, well, you seem to be really interested in the show. And I said, yeah, I think I can write a book about that show. And she said, oh yeah. And I said, yeah, I think I can do it in a month. And so about three weeks later, I had the book. Um, it was just one of those things just kind of where you have something just kind of pour out of you for some reason. Uh, a lot of things I've been thinking about got touched on in a certain way in the show and they kind of came together in the writing of that book. I mean, I tried to I tried to keep the book more or less popular in tone. Although this goes back to that comment about James and an educated audience, you know, I'm not sure if it's really super accessible for just everyone. But I do think anyone who reads it with some degree of seriousness can you know can follow along and see what's see what's happening uh, in the book uh, and the way in which I'm interested in the problem of other minds. The way in which I'm interested in the appearance reality distinction and its many inflections in the show, um, uh, the way in which I'm interested in the language of the show, the particular kind of density and resonance that it, it, it has and the devices that are used for uh, achieving that, all those things I think are you know, sort of reasonably approachable and easy enough to see. But I do think it's hard to understand if you, if you have watched the show because it is, it is very much unsaturated you need to fill in the blank spot with the 90 some episodes or you're not going to know what what i'm saying or why it would mean anything well i i do hope to get around to the show so my main motivation for reading the show is so that i can then you know read the book read the book with more profit i'm i'm, I'm working right now actually on sort of re redoing the book I, as you know the book had a kind of funny history i i wrote it very quickly i sent it off it got accepted for publication immediately and then the publisher got cold feet because I, I, since I'm interested in the language, I quote fairly extensively from the show. They were worried, so they were. They told me I needed to talk to Warner Brothers and make sure Warner Brothers would okay it. I finally found a Warner Brothers lawyer who basically told me, well, we just don't okay anything of this sort, so we don't have to think about it. Uh, and so the publishers were like, well, if Warner Brothers won't say it's okay, even though we think it's within the bounds of fair use, we don't, we're not sure we should publish it. And so I ended up deciding, well, I'm not going to fight with this anymore because I'll probably end up having to jump through the same hoop again. Uh, I'll just put it out there. I won't charge any money for it. There won't be any question of me making any money from it. Um, and I'll let it, let it be available. And, and it's been read and read and read and read. And I've been really pleased by the audience the book has had, even if it never had any formal, you know, any formal publication. Right. Another question is, you know, there's sort of a divide uh, among those people who think that there is a, you know, an unbridgeable gap between 
sort of Wittgensteinian approaches to religion and sort of more traditional like medieval approaches to religion where one seems like a, you know, a metaphysically freighted conception and another's one that sort of dis dispenses with any kind of metaphysical description. On the other hand, you've got people like Geach and Anscombe who obviously thought that you could do a, um, uh, you know, you could do a fairly tight marriage between, you know, let's say Aquinas and Wittgenstein, uh, however much each one might be unhappy with the, you know, with the shotgun wedding there. Oh, um, the yoke. And, you know, my impression is it often feels like you're somewhere in between there, but I'm not sure where. Uh, well, I'm not sure if I know where, Roderick, to be honest. I mean, yes, I, I mean, my sympathies lie with Geach and Anscombe in various ways. Um, and, you know, you mentioned my interest in Orthodox theology. I mean, among the things that draws me to Orthodox theology is it's, uh, it's apathetic way of thinking about uh, religion, uh, a kind of, you know, via negativa. And, and it, just for the, for the sake of, uh, of uh, my viewers, this is, this is the view that you can't, uh, you can't describe a, you know, any positive properties or descriptions uh, uh, to God. You can, you can only say, you know, God is not this, God is not that, but you can't, literally ascribe anything to God, which is um, supposed to be different from the analogical view that you yeah. can say God is wise and so forth, but analogically, although how different it is, is, you know, yeah. is and that's, that's, of course, one of the reasons I'm also not sure about where I stand exactly in relationship to people like Anscom and Geach. Uh, you know, Geach has that, that really interesting paper on analogical predicates uh, and how far he is from, you know, some sort of apophaticism, I, I'm not sure. Uh, at any rate, there's, I think, again, for, for, for pe people who know Wittgenstein and know particularly Wittgenstein's thinking about logic, there's something right, undeniably right, I think, about saying that Wittgenstein is a sort of apophatic logician. <laughs> uh, logic travels the via negativa. And, you know, that can, that can make you think, well, then, if you're going to think about religion from a Wittgensteinian point of view, it's going to have to be this, you know, sort of met this way of thinking about religion that's shorn of metaphysical commitment you know, uh, and so on. But I'm not sure that's quite right. I mean, I'm not sure that, that, that Wittgenstein would have thought that was quite right. Um, uh, I don't think that Wittgenstein's going to be comfortable with any view of religion on which religious language you know, just turns out to be, as it were, standard cognitive language or turns out to be just, as it were, figures of speech that vary from standard cognitive language as figures of speech vary from standard cognitive language. I don't think Wittgenstein thought into that. I think he's you know, much closer to someone like Kierkegaard in thinking that, no, you know, to understand religious language is to take up a particular kind of point of view. It's a, a kind of understanding that's different than the kind of understanding that's evinced when you come to understand a new metaphor or something like that. It's a shift in perspective of a, of a kind that has to occur, a personal perspective that has to occur in order for it to work. But I, I'm not sure how far I, I know to take all of that. I mean, I can say those things. I have some feeling that that's right. Or, I mean, right, I, I have quite a, I'm quite sure it's right of Kierkegaard. I, I, it seems right to me more generally, uh, right of the phenomenon. But I, I will say this is an area of my own thinking that's certainly you know, very much WIP. When, uh, you know, this is where I'm, I'm still very much at sea about a lot of things myself. I'm not sure quite what I think. I, as I tell my students in my philosophy of religion class, where we start with James and with Royce, um, with their controversy over varieties of religious experience, you know, Royce's response and sources of religious insight, I do think that the philosophy of religion as it's standardly done in analytic philosophy is sort of unresponsive to the full range of the phenomenon. You know, James's varieties, remember, has as a subtitle, a study in human nature. Uh, that seems to me to be sort of where you orient yourself to get going with all of this, not on, you know, a, a particular proposition on a board or a particular syllogism on a board. Uh, not that any of that's illegitimate or won't be something that we eventually do. I just like my students to remember what the actual phenomenon of religious life looks like uh, before we start worrying about what the proofs are for the existence of God. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is listed, it's sort of at least vaguely related to you know, one of my contributions to the to that Wittgenstein key textbook, where I talk about 
in what sense a Wittgensteinian can and what sense they can't embrace a project of metaphysics. Yes. Uh, because, you know, a lot of views, you know, if you're a Wittgensteinian or you know, if you're even sort of heavily Wittgensteinian, then there's nothing that looks at all like traditional metaphysics that's permissible at all. And I want to say, well, I mean, I, I don't give sort of a definite sorting out of what to say, but I say, well, you know, in effect, well, it depends what you mean. It depends how you're using the, the term metaphysics uh, or, you know, what, you know, what moves you're actually um, uh, making with it. The fact that something doesn't, doesn't play its standard. And this also connects with what you just said about poetry. The fact that something doesn't play its standard a word doesn't play its standard um, uh, role in the uh, in the language. It doesn't mean that it's just sort of completely idling. Yes. Uh, it can be doing something, you know, more complicated, and there may not be any literal way of uh, of describing it. Um, you know, just as you know, and the whole point of of the um, you know of the concept horse book is uh, that you know that uh, concepts in Frege's sense you can't really say anything about because that would put them in the in the um you know in the position in the sentence that, that gets things attributed to them instead they're the attributing part and so you can't say anything about them so in a sense you know, logic is ineffable in that sense but it's not ineffable in the sense of woo weirdy woo uh it's uh it's just you know it's just a it's a logical point that uh you know if the nature of something is uh you know, is to attribute properties to something, then if you start talking about it as the thing that gets properties attributed to it, you're sort of changing the subject, yes. literally. Um, yes. And that doesn't mean that you can't make clear what you mean, uh, you know, even though strictly speaking, literally, uh, you know, if I say uh, you can't, um, you know, you can't apply properties to the concept horse, Strictly speaking, from Fregian and Wittgenstein terms, that's nonsense. But it's not just plain old blue, blue nonsense. Uh, it's useful nonsense because it it helps you see, you know, it helps you see how to use how to use the terms. Yeah, yeah. Someone is not a name. You know, it's uh, these kinds of things that you know, function as something like what Frege was thinking of as elucidations. You know, that have a particular role to play, even if. They turn out not to be things that are, so to speak, susceptible of formulation in the logical language thus formulated. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And again, that's but that's also connected, as you know, with you know my thought about sort of apophaticism and the ineffability. Because I mean, in, you know, we talked about at the beginning of, of our discussion the Frege's three principles. But I suppose, in many ways, maybe even deeper than that, for me, at the center of what I've done as a philosopher has always been. The contrast between the ineffable and the ineffable. Uh, for some reason, that contrast. What's that line of, of Ahab's movie? It heaps me. It tasks me. <laughs> <laughs> I can't stop thinking about what can't be said. <laughs> well, uh, if you, uh, you know, if you come into philosophy part in part through Wittgenstein, then you got the whole, you know, got the whole Tractatus there balancing yeah. on the. Exactly. Balancing on a uh, on a an afterword of negation. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't actually say any of that. Yeah. But I had some reason for writing it. <laughs> no. Yeah, there's that great line of Kierkegaard. There's a difference between writing a book and revoking it and not writing it at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well I can I could type a bunch of stuff and then you know use the Use the um, the function on Word to put a line through it. It's still perfectly readable. Yeah. So I publish if I publish that with the lines through it, but you can read it all. Then uh, yeah, that's not the same thing. It's just you know not writing it up. Yeah. yeah. Um. So what are you working on these days? Well, um, I've been tinkering with fiction, um, and so over the last couple of years, I've written. An embarrassing number of novels that I haven't tried to publish. Um, uh, I've been continuing to tinker with that some. Um, I mean, it's not completely new because I, I remember when I first came to Auburn, you showed me some short stories that you'd written. Yeah, uh, I've been interested in that, you know, in, in writing fiction for a long time. I just, I hadn't tried really, hadn't tried, made a serious run at a novel until about two years ago when I you know, first, first did it. 
And in many ways, like a lot of things I work on, <laughs> I admit, they're often just, you know, sort of contests between me and me. I just want to, I just want to prove to myself that I can do it. You know, can I pull this off? Um, but I've, I've, I've been working on that. But right now I'm working on uh, actually a paper on Cavell and Kierkegaard uh, for a volume uh, that's coming out from Cambridge on the uh, 50th anniversary of Must We Mean What We Say. So I'm, I'm working on that essay of Cavell's on Kierkegaard's authority and revelation. Uh, that's the thing I'm literally currently writing. It's on the other screen on my computer. Uh, I've been working on that. Um, I've been tinkering for a while now on a book on Thoreau, but I have parts of written, but that I never. Been I remember written. seeing you a number of years ago. Some something from you of ah uh, that yeah. looked like the beginning of that. Yeah, I've had I've had stuff around for a long time. I've got a lot of pieces. Part of the problem has been that I've never been able quite to decide what the audience is you know, that I want to target with it, and so I kind of go back and forth and how to pitch it because there's a. I mean, one of the things I'd really like to be able to do in the book is to to talk about what I think is a really interesting and fruitful connection between transcendentalism generally and Thoreau's version in particular and Merleau Ponty's book, The Visible and the Invisible. Um, but you know, the Merleau Ponty is extraordinarily hard to understand. And so trying to write for an audience that could do anything with the Merleau Ponty is to write for an audience much smaller, smaller than the audience that could presum presumably do something with a lot of what I'd want to say about Thoreau. So I haven't been able quite to, that's one of the things I haven't been able to sort well, out. You can stick Marilyn Ponty into a later chapter. Yeah, it's true. So they yeah. would, you know, they would get through all of it until they got to that last chapter and then they would, you know. Outstrap, would... snap shut. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at any rate, the, you know, the, the salad was great. The entree was great. The dessert is a little, you know, is a little tough to digest, but still you had a good meal anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I've been, I've been tinkering with that Thoreau book for a long time because I'd really like to, I'd really like to try to, to write a book on Walton. I, I really do have that ambition. And so I'd like to, I'd like to get it done. And then beyond that, I've got um, some new stuff on, I've been thinking about some new stuff with Frege and Wittgenstein, though I haven't really launched any project there, but it's been on my mind. Um, and I've, I've gotten, I mentioned him uh, a few minutes ago in passing in a different context, but I've also gotten really interested again in F.H. Bradley, a philosopher that I, I got interested in as a freshman in college. Uh, uh, I, I don't know what it is exactly about Bradley that I find so interesting, but I do find him very interesting. And I'd like to, at some point, try to write a bit about Bradley in the next year or so. so still thinking about you know, how that might work, but, but I'd like to do that. I remember during my early years here, one of the uh, courses of yours I sat in on was uh, when going through Cavell's Pursuits of Happiness, which is a, uh, uh, a book where he, uh, he, um, he goes through what he calls comedies of remarriage, a bunch of, um, uh, a bunch of uh, Hollywood films, mostly from the 30s and 40s, uh, um, that sometimes are treated under the general category of screwball comedies, but in particular they are often about the reuniting of couples who had split up, hence the, hence the title. Uh, but, he, but he takes them to have sort of you know, a philosophical uh, weight that uh, they don't often have. And that was really a, an interesting course. Um, and I think we also read a little bit of, uh, was it The Claim of Reason that we read a bit of in there? Yeah, The Claim of Reason. Uh -huh. Yeah, that's that that book. I was just actually talking with a student about that book the other day. Uh, yeah, I really, as you know, I really admire that book, and I love those films, the ones that Cavell uh, collects there to to think about. Um, and you know, certainly, uh, my interest in things like television, in things like Chuck, you know, is downstream from all of that that stuff, uh, the work on those films and so on. Um, I. I agree with Cavell that there's there's gold and then there are hills. You just have to sort of know how to pan for it, uh, how to find it. There are things of, of real interest philosophically, um, and yeah, I'd like to I'd like to teach that class again. Maybe I will, you know, sometime soon. It's been a 
it's been a while since I've, I've gone back and saw those movies as a group. I do see one or another of them every now and then because I just love them so much, but it's, but it is fun to see them sort of in, in series uh, as Cavell's thinking about them. Are you the one who got me into Gerald Mast's book on Howard Hawks? Yes. Yeah, that great book on Hawks. Yeah. So, I mean, Robin Wood's work is better known on Hawks, but uh, I really, really like Mast's book on Hawks. That's my view too. I, I mean, I like I like the Woods, but but I, I the Mast is my favorite. Yeah. yeah, I really like that book. And I, you know, yeah, I'd like to. I've thought a lot about trying to do a class. I wrote a Western um, novel that actually has a a kind of, you know. Rio Bravo slant in it, in the sense that you know Hawks made Rio Bravo as a kind of response to High Noon. He didn't like the sort of isolated hero that everyone abandons, who has to then fight the bad guys all by his lonesome. Uh, Hawks wasn't a fan of that, and so in Rio Bravo, as you know, John Wayne can't get people to stop helping him. Everybody keeps helping him all the time. Um, and the, the, the novel that I wrote has something of that structure in it. The, 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 the opening of the book you know, has the, this kind of plays with the sort of lone Western hero against an empty horizon. And then slowly but surely the horizon gets populated and other people come into the story. And uh, it ends much more in a hawk's place than in the, the place of high noon. Yeah, I really have, as I recall, Mass takes a number of, of Hawks' films to be sort of, in a way, replies to earlier films. That's the way that the big sleep replies to um, the Maltese Falcon or uh, to have and have not replies to, uh, you know, to uh, Casablanca in the sense that certain kinds of, certain kinds of conflicts, like conflicts between uh, love and work or between uh, love and duty and so forth that are central to those, uh, are central to the earlier ones, he wants to challenge. And so although there's, there's a clear, you know, echoing of the earlier movies, you know, the you know, part of the reason that the Hawks movies end happily where those ones uh, end uh, not so happily is that he's, um, uh, you know, he's trying to try to rethink these, this connection uh, in such a way as to you know, make it more of a, you know, not, uh, not believing in the deep conflict. Yeah, I think that's right. And there's that, there's that great line about William James that he was, you know, afraid to draw a distinction for fear it would become a dualism. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I don't think that's quite Hawks, but I do think Hawks saw something dualistic in a lot of these earlier films and, you know, dualistic in something like, you know, the, the, the true pejorative sense of that term, the, the sense of dualism where it becomes impossible to explain the relationship between the two things, you know, thus distinguished in the dualism. And I think that much of what Hawks does is attempts to show that those dualisms are a product of a certain kind of fantasy in the earlier films or a certain kind of misguided thinking at any rate they're imposed on the characters in a way that's that's not realistic um, and so yeah i think he's often trying to show you that these things while not perhaps always easy to balance aren't somehow fated to be imbalanced in the way that perhaps you know you might think these earlier films suggest that they yeah i mean you could think of it as kind of an aristotelian approach yeah. in the sense of of you know a unity uh, of the virtues, a unity of um, a unity between self-interest and morality, uh, as as opposed to the view that there's you, know, you have to choose between one or the other. Rather, you know, if you have to, from Aristotle's point of view, if you have to choose between self-interest and morality, you've, reconce you've misconceived yes. one or the other or both because you're uh, you know, because uh, on the one hand, morality requires sort of a proper self-regard, but on the other hand proper vir virtue means functioning as a human being, not just as an um, organism. And being a human being involves a kind of engagement with reason and virtue and so on. Yeah, there's that great line of, of Samuel Johnson's where he says, you know, striving, in the, the highest of human felicities is striving and conquering. Second best is striving and deserving to conquer. Um, you know, I think part of what Hawks is so interested in is the way in which this, this sort of dualisms in these early, earlier films, in a, in a sense, invalidate the striving of the characters uh, you know there's no there's nowhere for them to go no nothing nothing to conquer no achievement to to make and i think you know, he's trying to reconceive these things so that there is scope for human achievement you know where these things are concerned where striving need not always be uh, a 
failure. Yeah. I mean, this, you know, Casablanca has a little bit more hope at the end than, um, uh, than the Maltese Falcon does, because at least, you know, he's, he's got his, his beautiful friendship fighting the Nazis uh, yes. with uh, Claude Rains. Um, and so that, you know, there's, he's got a, he's got a worthwhile project that he's, you know, that he's going to be enjoying and be uh, good at. Yeah, and it's important that he, you know, he ends that film, so to speak, deserving of Igram Bergman, even if he doesn't get to have her. Yeah. Of course, you always wonder what happens after the war is over. Because sure. the, the, main re the main reason for her going off is he's so good, her husband's going to be so important to the war effort, and he's not going to be good for the war effort unless he has his Ingrid Bergman. But, um, you know, it was only a few years later the war was over, and I wonder how, how that marriage would have survived. <laughs> Yeah, but this is a crucial, you know, this, th that kind of thing is a crucial moment, for instance, in, um, in Austin novels, you know, in all the novels, the, I think in all the novels, it's true that the heroine comes to a point where she thinks that she simply can't have her choice, um, that it's done and finished. Uh, it turns out always that she does get her choice, but it's crucial to see that that moment occurs in the story because to, to think of Austin's endings as simply happy endings is to miss that moment where the character fully recognizes and acknowledges that however the story is about what she deserves, she isn't going to get it. Um, and you know, her willingness to sort of accept that is always preludial to whatever chance event, like Lucy still proving to be every bit as superficial as you would have thought in Sense and Sensibility, and so shifting Harrow's brothers. Uh, and so Eleanor gets to marry Edward after all. You know. Yeah, all that happens, but it's crucial that before that, Eleanor is schooling herself in resignation. Um, <laughs> you know, and that's, I think, a really important piece of what you have to recognize and appreciate what Austin's doing. Yeah, because although the, you know, although in the Aristotelian view or, or the Hawksian view, you know, uh, you know, there is a, a possibility of reconciling these things, that doesn't mean that people always get what they deserve no. uh, or that they always get the merited results of their... No, that's right. And I, and I think it's that complexity that you just named that you know is motivating Hawks in many ways. I mean, Hawks knows what's causing these prior films to think about things in the way that they do, but you know, but they, they want to take this sort of all or nothing kind of you know, view of things. And Hawks' idea is no. I mean, sometimes you know things don't work out, but sometimes they do. <laughs> you know, it's not fated that they won't. And sometimes they don't because you hadn't thought creatively enough about how they might. Yeah, yeah, you haven't striven in the right way. Yeah. Well, we should probably start right to get to wrap up now because an hour and a half is about the limit to which my system can handle a long video before it just takes forever to to process. Um, but this has been really fun. Maybe we can do it, you know, again sometime. Yeah. Any any, any final uh thoughts no no i appreciate you having me on as you said it was a lot of fun it's all this pandemic stuff i haven't gotten to talk to you in a long time so yeah for me despite the fact that there will be an audience uh it was just good to good to mm -hmm. chat with you again yeah no me too um and we could always chat you know sometime without an audience online too True. I, I've, I've got to get over my, my sort of zoom phobia <laughs> yeah but that's true but, but you know but i suspect a you know, I suppose I suspect a number of our of my viewers will be will enjoy this, even if they they don't always follow all the details of Frege's three Frege's three principles or the apathetic theology. I think they will right. will find it engaging and would, would might like a a repeat performance. Anyway, so thanks a lot okay, for coming you. on. I, I often forget to thank people at the end of these videos, not out of ingratitude, but just out of you know focusing on the uh, you know on the um, mechanics of of uh you know, stopping the recording so i remember thank you for coming on uh and respectively thank you to everyone else i interviewed that i forgot to thank at the end of the uh, uh of their videos but i'm grateful to them too um uh and uh um and to my viewers uh if you enjoyed this and want to see more like share subscribe all that good stuff and uh see you next time